While Alaska houses an immense wilderness, it also has many people who call the land within its borders home. After spending time here and having so many amazing adventures, we could feel the draw of this beautiful state. Even though we were so far from the rest of the country and the people and places we were most familiar with, we were starting to gain an understanding of why people choose to make Alaska home. As we were leaving Alaska's Kenai Peninsula, we decided to make a detour over to the town of Whittier. En route, the road drives through the beautiful Portage Valley, named as such for the Portage Glacier that exists at one end. We stopped along the way to take in the sights of a few glacial lakes and the Portage River that flows from the beautiful Portage Lake. Along the lakeshore stands the Begich Boggs Visitor Center, which we stopped at to explore. This center is run by the Forest Service and houses information about Alaska's glaciers, glacial regions, and the Portage Glacier that exists just up at the end of the lake. From the visitor center, Whittier is only a short way further, but is only accessed by air, water, or the one-way tunnel that shares traffic with a train. We are on our way out to Whittier, and we are waiting in line right now to go through the tunnel that you have to go through to get to Whittier through this mountain. And this tunnel is unique because it's only one lane. So we have to share going through it with the traffic trying to come from Whittier to Anchorage area and we'd share it with a train. So we're waiting in line and this is going to be very interesting. This rough, rock-hewn tunnel is the only ground access to the city, and until the early 2000s, the tunnel was for trains only. Each end of the tunnel has long waiting areas where traffic lines up, and if no trains come, street vehicles are allowed through the tunnel each half hour after the tunnel has cleared from opposing traffic. We found the schedule was rarely followed due to the presence of trains that have the right of way, and our wait time was significantly longer. The tunnel is two and a half miles long, drips water on you, and is a bit squirrely to drive in because you're driving on train tracks covered by rubber mats and steel plates. Even though it's narrow and tight, RVs can drive this tunnel as long as they're not taller than 14 feet or wider than 10. Out the other end of the tunnel, Whittier immediately comes into view. This town is a popular freight and cruise ship port that utilizes the Alaska Railway to move arriving cargo and passengers inland. At one end of the town, a very large abandoned building hints at this town's unique beginnings as a secret city. During World War II, the site of this town was selected to build a port for shipping supplies and troops to Alaska. The vacant building is the Buckner Building, and was the barracks and main housing facility during the military presence. Because of the military origins, the town has very little private property, and most of the residents live in one large apartment building, currently called the Begich Towers. This building was originally the headquarters for the Army Corps of Engineers, but they too moved out shortly after the war. Over the years, this building has become the central hub for Whittier, as it houses the residents, a small store, post office, police, and many other essential amenities. We were told that many residents never even need to leave the building during some of the winter months, as everything they need is under one roof. As interesting as this housing arrangement was, we found ourselves a neat boondocking site for the night, as the next day we had a very unique adventure planned. 
So we spent the night here in Whittier and got up early this morning to go on our final Whittier adventure. As you can see from the jet skis behind me, we've got something big planned. We are here at Glacier Jet Ski Adventures and we are going to be going on a glacier tour on one of these things. Before we started this journey, Kate told me she wanted to go jet skiing in Alaska, and I didn't think it was possible. But here we were, suiting up in full dry suits with gloves and helmets to go experience the glaciers of Blackstone Bay by jet ski. We had a group of six jet skis, four of us and two guides, one for the front and one for the back of the group. We had radio communications in our ears so that we could hear the guides, and after figuring out how these awesome jet skis worked, we took off as a group into the bay. The morning was cool, but the full dry suits and gloves kept us warm, even when getting some sea spray on us. We ran for a while before our guide stopped us to make sure everything was okay and everyone was comfortable with their boats, before we headed on for our first up-close glacier stop, where a hanging glacier above dumped a waterfall directly into the ocean. After the waterfall, we headed to the end of Blackstone Bay, where two massive glaciers descended into the ocean. We slowly navigated small icebergs until we had an amazing view of the massive wall of ice. This is so cool! <laughs> to be out here on the water and in control of your own craft to see these glaciers, it's just, it's unreal. And we have like the most perfect, beautiful day to do it. We stopped the jet skis and enjoyed a snack here while our guides educated us about these glaciers and their recent and significant retreat that they had been watching day by day. With the skis off, we could hear the glacier creaking and groaning and even watched a few pieces of ice drop to the water. After a while, we suited back up and completed our 60 mile round trip journey back to the docks, maintaining a 50 to 60 mile per hour speed the whole time. Being in control of our own small craft out on the waters of Alaska's coast was an incredible way to experience the nature, weather, and wildlife of this spectacular place firsthand. After our glacier experience, we left Whittier via the tunnel once again and headed back towards Anchorage. Traveling along Turnigan Arm, we saw a bunch of activity and surfers setting up alongside the road. We stopped to see what was going on and first saw a bunch of beluga whales swimming around in the turbid waters. These whales come up this shallow arm to feed, but this can be hazardous as they occasionally get stranded on the mudflats due to the fast outgoing tides. While this bay is large, no ocean waves make it in here, but a natural phenomenon occurs here that pushes up a true tidal wave. While it is said that the moon's gravity causes tides, it is not just gravitational acceleration, but also centrifugal forces due to the locked orbit of the Earth-Moon system that can be simulated as tiny tangential acceleration vectors acting on our planet-sized body of water. This builds up water pressure and creates a bulge or a wave in the ocean about two feet tall that we know as our ocean tides. These waves undulate in perfect harmony with the Moon and Sun's position, 
but the bathymetry or shape of the shoreline and ocean floor have significant impact on these waves. Just like a standard wave coming ashore, tides can get pushed up due to long shallow areas or trapped in long skinny fjords like the ones that exist along the Alaska coast and create much larger swings in water like we had seen in Homer, Seward, Valdez, and now here with the phenomenon called a bore wave. Here in Turnigan Arm, the incoming tide actually creates a shallow wave that is big enough to surf. Because tides are quite predictable, one can get in position and wait for the wave. We witnessed many paddleboarders, kayakers, and surfers out in the cold muddy waters of Turnigan Arm awaiting the wave. After watching the surfers, we headed on to Anchorage to visit a family we had met earlier in the summer along the Denali Highway. When we got there, Bob Kaufman, professional photographer, pilot, and founder of Alaska.org, offered to take us for a spin in a Robinson R44 helicopter to see a few of the sights up in the Chugach mountain range. After taking off from Merrill Field in downtown Anchorage, we headed through thick smoke towards the Chugach Mountains. Within only a few minutes of being airborne, we were in the mountains and visibility started to improve. Traveling over these ridges by helicopter was incredible and we couldn't wipe the smiles from our faces. At one point, we even briefly landed near the top of a mountain, right next to a very confused mountain goat. Bob flew us out to the high elevation ice fields and swooped down glaciers. At the bottom of one of the glaciers, we followed a river valley to a glacial lake easily accessible only by air, Lake George. Here we landed to explore the shoreline and watch the incredible, enormous icebergs floating around in this remote glacial lake.
Here along the shore of this amazing lake, we had a picnic and chatted with Bob about life in Alaska. We've, we've heard that story of people coming up for a vacation or, or right. some little project and they end up staying. Is that a pretty common for that's Alaskans? A lot, that's a lot of people. You know, how did you get to Alaska? Well, I came up for a summer job 30 years ago, or I came up for a vacation five years ago. It happens a lot because it's a world so different mm -hmm. from the world most people grew up in. A lot of people come up here for that reason. I would say some people come up for an oil job, some people come up for other kinds of jobs. It wasn't the outdoors that motivated them to come here, but a lot of people do come for the outdoors. And the big difference between Alaska and the lower 48, there's a couple of big differences. One, the wilderness is big, it's huge. And secondly, it's, it's, it's right outside where you live. So it's accessible. So you've got this juxtaposition of untouched wilderness with a modern urban lifestyle with all the conveniences of modern life. So yes, it's very different than other places. I mean, there are towns like Boulder and places in the West that are really good. They're, they're also in the outdoors. But um, you know, what's, what's great about Alaska, people come up here, you can do raft trips for days and not see a soul. You can do backpacking trips for a week, two weeks, not see anyone. Many people fly. A lot of people fly up here because we have so few roads. A lot of people are into hunting and fishing. People don't come up here for the culture. They don't come up here because they're professionally ambitious. I think they come up here for a way of life that has disappeared in the lower 48. Do Alaskans have a pretty good sense of community? Uh, do, they, do they bond together or are they relatively solo? So there's a great sense of community. I mean, even people who want to go in the wilderness solo and be pretty hardcore, they live in towns where they have close friends. I mean, your family is so far away from you when you live in Alaska that your friends become like family. And I think there's a lot of camaraderie. There's different communities in Alaska. The outdoor community, especially the hardcore outdoor community, there's a lot of camaraderie there. You can't figure out how to do these things except through going with somebody who has more experience. It's like the ultimate apprenticeship skill to gain, right? Spending time in the wilderness, doing raft trips, doing ice climbing. You, you don't read a book and go do this. The way you do it is more experienced people take you, and then as you get experience, you take other people. The other thing about Alaska society that I think is really different from the lower 48 is it's more egalitarian here. So you cannot tell from the car somebody drives or from where they live or from the clothes they wear, whether they're unemployed or whether they have $10 million in the bank. And, and people don't care. That's not what they talk about up here. They want to know where'd you go hunting? Where did you go fishing? So it's really nice in that way. It's, it's more of a classless society than the lower 48. I think it, it comes from priorities that Alaskans have. You don't come up here because you want to get rich. It's not, not why you would move to Alaska. If you're not from here, if you're from a conventional place like I was, and you choose to move here, by definition, you're elevating some values over others, right? You want to be in the outdoors. You want more adventure. Perhaps you want more freedom. You want more flexibility and control over your life. So if you've chosen that value system, you're probably not gonna emphasize the kinds of value systems that are dominant in big cities in the lower 48, where you frankly need a lot of money just to have a decent house or to have a healthy lifestyle. You don't need a lot of money to have a healthy lifestyle in Alaska. We flew directly back to Anchorage, and amazingly, the incredible spot that we had been at was only half an hour away by air. Thing. Oh my gosh, it was awesome! It was incredible! It was my first time in a helicopter, and oh my gosh, it was just like the best thing ever. We landed on top of a mountain <laughs> and alongside and a lake that you can't even hike to. It was unbelievable, and the views from sitting there were just astonishing. We'd go over those ridges and it would just drop away. It was like it was like being inside of a drone. We've done a lot of drone flying, but we were actually in the drone and going like super fast. It was awesome. After our Anchorage adventures, we headed north once again, this time driving the Parks Highway. 
Fall was in full swing and the weather was beginning to turn wet, but that didn't stop us from hiking and enjoying the bright colors of the high elevation tundra. While it was getting late in the season and soon we would be chased south by the weather, we were headed back to Fairbanks for a chance at experiencing another northern bucket list item. Now that the sun was setting, late one night when looking to the north, we caught our first glimpse of the phenomenon we had come to see. 